Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Miller, and welcome to this lecture on Jain Relativism, or Anekantavada. This lecture will follow Paul Dundas's book, The Jains, pages 227 to 244. We begin here with a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, which says, My Anekantavada is the result of the twin doctrines of Satya and Ahimsa. Anekantavada, broadly speaking, is a Jain term that reflects the fact that no one philosophical or religious perspective can contain the entire truth. Instead, all religious and philosophical perspectives are partial and need to be taken as such and need to be considered when trying to arrive at truth. So everybody has a limited perspective and we have to consider everybody's perspective. Now in the original history of Jainism or going back in history in Jainism, the original meaning of this meant to convey that the Jains had this fundamental insight and that no one after the Tirtankaras who were omniscient was able to grasp at reality. But as we can see within the Jain tradition, there were those who were omniscient, these Tirtankaras. And so in the original meaning of this word, as we'll see on the Kantavada, it meant to convey that Jainism had a certain moral superiority over other religious traditions and perspectives because it had discovered this idea of an Kantavada. All right, so it was originally intended to show a certain amount of moral and philosophical superiority. Although as we see coming into the present, it gets reinterpreted to mean a sort of message of universal religious tolerance, meaning we have to consider everybody's perspectives. All religions are trying to go for the same goal, but we have to kind of, we have to kind of consider all of them. No one is absolutely right, right? So the meaning will shift as history goes on, and we're gonna look at how that happened in this particular lecture. The topics that we'll look at are, we're going to unpack this word, anekantavada, the Jain doctrine of qualified moral relativism or qualified philosophical relativism. We're also going to look at Jain perspectives on Hinduism and Buddhism, because as I mentioned before, part of the early meaning of this idea of anekantavada was that the Jains ultimately held the highest truth because they had come up with this idea of philosophical moral relativism. And at the same time, although they had this openness to other religious traditions, they also, of course, had critiques of other religious traditions, especially Hinduism and Buddhism. So we'll see what those critiques were, what made Jainism unique compared to Hinduism and Buddhism, which was also, of course, arguing and making claims against Jainism at the time. So we'll visit some of those perspectives towards the end of the lecture. And as you see in the image here, we're seeing an illustration of the story of the blind men and the elephant. We're going to use this story to understand Anekantavada because the story is often told to convey the meaning of this very complex philosophical term and concept. To begin with an overview, and Dundas points this out, historically in the 19th century, okay, so not so long ago, during India's colonial period, intellectuals of Indian origin, of South Asian, of uh, Hindu origin really, started to promote a universal Hinduism to create unity among all religions, as well as unity among all people with a Vedic background in India. Why were they doing this? Well, of course the British had brought their, what they considered to be their superior Western culture, which was grounded in Christianity. And Christianity was seen as the supreme religion by those imperial forces. Therefore, these intellectuals in India began to build up what they considered to be a universal Hinduism that would unite the Indian people, that would promote peace and would promote harmony, right? But as well as a nationalist solidarity to bring all the people of India together to make them proud of their own indigenous tradition. Jainism was, of course, part of this, although, as we know, the Jains were a religious minority and they were eventually lumped in with the Hindus because it was hard for the British to tell them apart often because they worked so closely and shared so many practices with the colonial Hindus. But nevertheless, the Jains themselves shared these sentiments with these Hindu intellectuals. They wanted to show that India had its own religious legacy and tradition that was just as good as, if not better than the Christian tradition, right? So create some cultural pride, create some nationalist pride, and at the same time, try to create some unity, not only among your people, but with other people around the world to show that you are all embracing. And part of that will be the, the dissemination of this concept of anekantavada, that all perspectives are worth considering. Not one perspective is ultimately correct. 
This peacemaking, though, as Dundas points out, did not start here for the Jains, and in fact goes all the way back to Hari Bhadra, who we've looked at before in previous lectures, and Hema Chandra. So this is in the 8th and the 12th century of the Common Era. Hari Bhadra and Hema Chandra, as you recall, are the eminent exalters, the Prabhavaka, those who spread Prabhavana, all sorts of great teachings, debating skills, literary skill, and so on and so forth. So this idea of religious tolerance or tolerating the viewpoints of other religious traditions and philosophical perspectives did not begin in the 19th century as these intellectuals did in the, in the Hindu fold, as we see here in Dundas's book. But for the Jains, it began all the way back in the 8th century. And let's look at how that happened. And pictured here to the right is actually one of those intellectuals. This is Ram Mohan Roy, who is responsible for the formation of the Brahmo Samaj, which was a group that developed a universal Hinduism based not only in Vedic and Hindu and Upanishadic concepts, but also drew from other systems of Western thought like deism and transcendentalism and other forms of relig religiosity that, that they found to be inspiring from Western culture, right? So you can see them trying to create a bridge between Indian culture and Western culture, and yet to create some form of religious identity for Hindus and Indians that they could be proud of. So that's what's happening in the 19th century. So when we get towards the end of this lecture, we're gonna to return to this moment. We're gonna to return to the contemporary moment to see how the Jains contributed to this and how these ideas transformed because of the Jains. Okay, so starting towards the beginning, we have Hari Bhadra, again, one of the eminent exalters, very well respected and still well read within the Jain tradition. He was the first to write a collection of contemporary intellectual views, as Dundas points out, a doxography that showed all of the intellectual and philosophical views of his religious contemporaries. According to Hari Bhadra, as he collected and compiled all these religious perspectives into one compendium, he said, we have to respect other traditions according to their own internal logical coherence. If one lives a moral life according to the way that their tradition defines a moral life, they are worthy of our respect, right? So if you wanna take this at a global scale, right? This isn't what Hari Bhadra was doing, but if you think if a Christian has a certain way of being moral and they're following it, then they are worthy of our respect. If a Muslim does that, they're worthy of our respect. If a Jew does that, they're worthy of our respect, okay? Same with Hari Bhadra. If a Hindu or a Buddhist is living a moral life according to their traditions, internal logic, they are worthy of our respect, right? So he collected all these views and said, these are what your views are. If you're living according to them, then okay, you're worthy and your perspective is worthy, right? He also came up with the idea that all religious goals are the same. We're all ultimately trying to get to the same place, essentially liberation, right? To liberate ourselves from transmigration and reincarnation, right? So that was a shared perspective already amongst Buddhist, Hindus, and Jains. How you got there, however, was a different story, right? But he said, essentially, we're all trying to get to the same thing and we have different ways of doing it. We should respect each other's way of, of approaching ultimate reality and salvation. Here's a quote from Hari Bhadra in the box to the right. He said, I do not have partiality for Mahavira, right? So it's the founder of his tradition, Jainism. Nor do I revile people such as Kapila, the founder of the Hindu Sankhya system. One should instead have confidence in the person whose statements are in accord with reason. So if we can all agree on a, an approach to reason, and if within our own systems of logic, we have ways for for coming up with the way that life should be lived and ethics should be developed, we should give respect to that in each tradition. So he's trying to be as tolerant as possible. This is an early religious tolerance. Can't we all just get along? And this is where the doctrine of Anekantavada has its origins. Anekantavada, if you break it up, it's Sanskrit parts. You can see in parentheses in the first bullet point is an, which means not or without, a kanta, which means, can mean absoluteness or absolute, and vada, which means a doctrine. So this is the doctrine of non-absoluteness, okay? And it's also called anekantatva, often, more often referred to as anekantavada. So it's a doctrine of not having any one absolute view and is often translated, as you see here in bullet point number two, as the doctrine of many pointedness. There are many perspectives, right? All are at getting at some bit of the truth, but not the entire truth. 
According to Hari Bhadra, this idea has to be incorporated into any logical argument. It has to be incorporated to point out that no one person has the ultimate perspective. You can order, you can argue according to the internal logic of your particular cultural or religious system or philosophical system, but you have to recognize that it is limited. Why? Because according to the Jains, everyone has an inherently sullied jiva, okay, our souls. All of us have souls and they're all in one way, shape or form encased by various forms of karma that do not allow our omniscient soul to see 100% clearly. And therefore nobody can make inherent truth claims. Okay, so we all, if you wanna think about our, our body as the souls, we all have glasses on and all of our glasses are smudged, right? Even, even if some are smudged less than others, nobody can see perfectly through these glasses and not, therefore, nobody's soul is completely unsullied or completely able to be omniscient and know the ultimate, ultimate truth of all reality or be omniscient, right? Because in this day, day and age, essentially, nobody can reach liberation anymore, right? Nobody's soul is able to go where the Tirtankras have gone in this fallen age. They'll be able to later, but now it's not possible. We all have a soul in Jiva, therefore, all of our truth claims are are inherently limited, okay? So thus, as you see in the last bullet point, all truth claims can coexist, right? We will all make claims to truth, though nobody is ultimately right. But there's one exception to this, as we'll see. First, I want you to look at the illustration to the right. You've probably seen something like this before. Depending on where you're standing, if you're standing on the right wall or the left wall, you're going to have a different perspective on reality or truth. So if that is the truth, which you see here from the outside as I do with a blue circle in the middle and then the side being uh, orange or reddish or pinkish color, depending on how you see color. This is the perspective of what of, of a, an omniscient jiva, right? So we are looking in as a Tirtankara at the whole truth when we see the totality of this object, right? So if it were possible for people to hold, know the whole truth, this is how they would see it. However, all of us cannot do that. All of our souls are sullied. And so some of us are standing on the left side looking in and we see that, that we see a square shape and we see the reddish, pinkish, orangish color. Others of us are standing on the other side, on the blue side, and all we see is the blue circle, right? So this is Anekantavada. Depending on where you stand in life, socially, culturally, all your conditioning, all your karma, you will see truth or reality differently. And that's why at the bottom of this image, it says, please consider this before talking or typing, right? When you go to post something about politics or about anything else on social media, realize that you're seeing it from a particular perspective that has been accumulated throughout your entire life and that we have to consider multiple perspectives. Okay, so as Hari Bhadra and the Jains say, and you've seen the last bullet point again, all truth claims coexist, such as you see in the image here, though nobody is ultimately right, right? Nobody's ultimately right. They can't be because no one can see it fully, except as we'll see the Jains, right? Or the Tirtankaras at least, not necessarily the Jains, but the Tirtankaras. As the first bullet point points out here, according to this Jain philosophy of non-absolutism or many pointedness or not one perspective, Jain reason remains supreme within philosophical debate. And this is based on two assumptions that Hari Bhadra is making, right? So even though it says all perspectives have to be considered and they're all limited, ultimately the Jain perspective is supreme. Why? Well, according to Hari Bhadra and according to all Jains, the Ford makers are or were, they were, right? Because they were in the past, fully omniscient. And they still are because their soul is up there at the top of the loka looking down and they know everything. So the Ford makers were fully omniscient, right? So they could see all of reality and that happened within the Jain tradition, right? So the Jain tradition remains supreme because they have the fully omniscient beings who don't have a limited perspective of reality. Therefore, the Jain perspective is ultimate within this system, right? So we can see there's a little bit of a paradox here, right? It's a little bit, uh, it's on the one hand saying nothing, no view is absolute except for our view because it came from people who have an absolute view, right? Number two, the Ford makers regard reality as characterized by both permanence and change. Essentially, the Ford makers gave the teaching 
that we all have a soul and that this soul is ultimately sullied and covered in various forms of matter and karma that limit all of our perspective, right? So it's basically saying that the Ford makers are fully omniscient. Therefore, this doesn't apply to them on a Kantavada. And two, the Ford makers said that we have our soul covered in karma. Therefore, now we all, all of us, even the Jains, right, now have karmic matter that's sullying our soul, our jiva, and its ability to see all of reality as the Ford makers too, right? As Dunnis points out, the ability to achieve omniscience, right, to, to become all-knowing died out when Mahavira's last disciple, Sudharman, died. And since that's not possible anymore, we all will have a soli jiva. It's not possible for any of us, Jain or not, to see things ultimately as ultimate truth, right? None of us have that perspective, right? However, as you see in the next bullet point, due to the birthing of the insight of Anekantavada, the fact that the Jains came up with this, they use that or they used that, they don't anymore, but they used it to claim the moral high ground, right? To say, ultimately, we do have the highest perspective because we realize that all perspectives are limited. Bit of a paradox again, right? And it's here that we have to acknowledge that philosophy is becoming theology because all of these claims that are made here by Hari Badra and other Jain philosophers ultimately require faith in all of the assumptions that are being made, right? The, it requires faith that the Ford makers were fully omniscient, and it requires faith in the fact that the Ford makers said that we have an, an inherently sullied jiva. And if we have to have faith in both of those things, then and they're not, we're not able to prove them, then it, this is where philosophy is becoming theology. Okay, so one way to to the one way that the doctrine of Anekantavada is explained, not only by Jains, but just by anyone who's trying to, to figure out what this means, is with the story of the blind men and the elephant, right? So I say blind men, but there's also women in this picture because now we're, we're getting out of a patriarchal age and we, this is for everyone, right? So here we have, let's just say six blind people, right? And they're all standing around an elephant. They're either blind or they're blindfolded, depending on which version of the story you're telling. But it doesn't matter because either way they can't see what's in front of them. The first person standing all the way to the left feels the trunk of the elephant, right? They don't know it's an elephant. They're trying to figure out what it is and says, oh, is this a snake? You know, because the trunk of an elephant might feel like a snake, right? The next person standing next to the tusk of the elephant feels the tusk and says, is this a spear? Oh, this is a spear, right? The next person standing in the middle on the side of the elephant feels the side of the elephant and says, oh, this must be a wall because it's hard and flat and goes up and down, right? That makes sense from that perspective. The person in the back feels the tail, which feels like a rope, right? It also kind of looks like a rope a little bit. So having felt that, saying it's a rope, that seems like a reasonable, uh, reasonable conclusion to make, right? The uh, next person, number five, feels the leg of the animal, of the, of the elephant. And of course, an elephant's leg is really big, like a tree trunk. And this person says, oh, no, this is a tree. This is a tree, for sure. And then the last person you see standing behind in the back feels the ear of the elephant and says, oh, no, 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 this is a fan. It's moving. It's, it's, it's waving. It's cooling me off. There's air coming off of it. This is a fan. Now, we can see with the story of the blind men and the elephant or the blind people and the elephant or the blindfolded or however you want to say it, that these people are all right in that they're judging reality based on their limited perspective, but at the same time, they're all wrong. And even if you added up all of their perspectives, it would be difficult to arrive at this being an elephant, right? To conclude that this is an elephant. So if all we saw, if we didn't see this picture and we just listened to these people describe what they're seeing, it would be difficult for us to determine that this is actually an elephant, right? It would take a lot of very careful thought and, and consideration to figure that out. So this is Anekantavada. We all have a limited perspective on reality that's partially true, but ultimately not true. So how did this idea develop? Okay, so we talked about Hari Badra, but this idea first appears in a text called the Exposition of Explanations, which as Dundas points out, is difficult to date. 
In this text, it says that siat, the word siat, as you see in the second bullet point, should precede all statements, all truth statements. Siat is the optative of the verbal root us, which means to be. So siat means it could be, right? But it doesn't mean it is. If, if the verbal root us means to be, and then other words made from it in the present tense mean is or are, Siat says it could be, it might be, right? It doesn't make an absolute statement. And so the, the siad vada that you see in the third bullet point here, siad vada, which is a complement to anekanta vada, suggests that there's a doctrine of it could be, right? This is a philosophical doctrine of it might be, it may be, but we cannot ever be certain. And the from this were developed what are known as the seven modes, the septa pungi, which you see here to the right, right? So starting from the bottom left, we can say it may be, something may be true, or from another perspective, it may not be true, maybe not. And then from another perspective, it may be, or it may be not, I'm not sure. Or it may be, or it may be not, but in either case, it's inexplicable. We can't really ever ultimately know. Or it may be, but who knows? Or it may be not, but who knows? Or it may be, and it may be not, who knows? So as we can see here throughout this is, throughout all seven of these modes is the optative. It's showing that none of these statements, no matter how you make a statement about truth, can be ultimately true. It always has to be preceded by it might be, right? This is, a, this is a very humble way of approaching reality, right? A lot of people think they know everything. Uh, at times we all feel like we know the ultimate truth or how things should be or why they should be a certain way. But this is a more humbling way, a more humble and modest way of approaching reality of, of being somewhat certain, it may be, but not ever fully imposing your truth on somebody else. Wouldn't that be nice if we could all get along that way? Okay. I'm not gonna go through everything on this slide, but I'm gonna give you an example of what are known as the seven nayas that were developed by a Shvetambara named Malavadin in the fifth or sixth century of the common era. The seven nayas, as you see here in the first bullet point, were standpoints with which judgments about reality could be made or can be made. So we have to take all seven of these nayas to get close to the truth about something, right? Although each one of these nayas is limited and we can never ultimately know the absolute truth about something. But we have to use all seven of these to get close to an ultimate truth about something. Let's return to the elephant. So think of an elephant again and go down to number six, Sambiruda Naya, okay? In Sambiruda Naya, you focus entirely upon the etymological meaning of the words related to an object. For example, so etymology looks at the words, the roots of words and how they come to be, how they come to create nouns and verbs and so on and so forth. So for example, the etymology of the word elephant, right, is from the, the Latin word elephantus, which means ivory or elephant, right? So if we had the etymology of the thing that we're trying to figure out here for those six blind people or blindfolded people, and we're trying to figure out what that thing is and we're given the etymology of it, that it's ivory, right? That gives us a hint and a clue as to what something is, but it doesn't tell us about the entire object itself, right? It doesn't tell us that it's an elephant. It, 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 tell us, it tells us that ivory is one of its qualities or has at least been used, the word to mean ivory from Latin has at least been used to describe what that thing is, right? So that's the etymological approach to trying to figure out what something is, right? Then go to number seven. So you have that piece of information, ivory, okay? Number seven, evam buta naya. We consider the specific qualities of an object, right? So we can say that this thing has a trunk, it has tusks, it has big ears, but we may not even be able to say that it has those things because we might not be able to see it, right? We may be able to feel those things and we might think it's something else. So like the people who are feeling the elephant and describing its individual qualities, not knowing that it was an elephant, are giving us specific qualities of the object, right? It's, it's hard, it feels like a tree, it feels like a rope, it feels like a snake, it feels like a spear. But all of those things do not tell us ultimately what that thing is, right? So if you go through all seven of these and you can follow them at the link I have down here, there's a simple explanation at the bottom in this on hindubwebsite.com slash Jainism slash Naya. If you follow that, you can, you can see these in more detail, 
but you can see that even if you had all seven of these things, it would be difficult or not entirely possible to describe or figure out what something is. You know, maybe some certain things would be easier than others. But the idea is that you have to use all seven of these nayas to arrive at some truth about something in reality, right? So this is the doctrine of the seven nayas, another useful way for approaching reality while also acknowledging that all of these perspectives are ultimately not 100% true or can bring us 100% to the exact truth because none of us are omniscient and we're all limited as are these nayas. Okay, so that's a brief philosophical and historical background of the doctrine of anekantavada, of non-absoluteness, right? Today, as you can see, anekantavada is interpreted as an extension of nonviolence. And so think back to Gandhi. He said, my anekantavada is the result of my satya and my ahimsa, my nonviolence, right? So what it's interpreted to mean now today in the present age by contemporary Jains is it's meant to mean an intellectual ahimsa or a form of nonviolent intellectual approach to other people's perspectives intended to create a universal religious tolerance. Meaning they're basically saying that everyone has a different religious perspective around the world, right? In, in this globalized world that we now live in, everyone has a specific religious or philosophical perspective and we have to respect all those perspectives and be tolerant towards one another. Ultimately, everyone has their own truths, right? Well, that's close to what Haribhadra was saying, right? But as Dennis points out, this is a well-intended reinterpretation of the original meaning of the doctrine of Anikantavada, which was originally intended to establish Jainism's moral superiority, right? Going back to the slide where we showed all the assumptions that Haribhadra makes, it was originally intended to show that Jainism has the omniscient Tirthankaras. They are the ones who can see ultimate reality. And we are the ones within our tradition who gave birth to these great insights. And therefore, the Jain tradition is ultimately morally superior, even if anyone in the Jain tradition today can no longer see things from an omniscient perspective. So you can see that there's a, a slight reinterpretation here where they're not claiming superiority anymore. They're still claiming pride in this intellectual ahimsa, an idea of universal religious tolerance, but they're not using it to say we are better than all the others or that we ultimately have the highest, most superior perspective on reality. Now they're using it to say, let us all tolerate one another. Let us all get along, right? You see this beautiful Twitter post to the right that somebody posted that says, ahimsa and anekantavada, things to live by, right? Nonviolence, and then this multi-perspectivalism or non-absolutism, things to live by, which sounds really nice, right? Which sounds like, can't we all just be nice to each other? Can't we all accept that there's going to be different viewpoints and just get along? This is, as Dundas points out, a well-intended reinterpretation of the original meaning, which was intended to establish a moral and philosophical superiority for the Jain tradition. Okay, so that's a background on Anikantavada, both past and present. And then just to finish up here with a couple of slides, I'm going to look at with you the perspectives that Jains had of Hindus and that Jains had of Buddhists. Of course, we've already seen some of the perspectives that other religious traditions have had of the Jains and how they tried to paint them in a bad light in ways that were stereotypical and really not so nice, right? And not true. So the Jains consistently attack the foundations of Hinduism, as you see in the first bullet point here. One of the things that they challenged was the Veda's divine authorship, right? So if you are a Hindu and you subscribe to the authority of the Vedas, you subscribe to the idea that the Vedas are timeless wisdom that were channeled by the rishis or the sages for the benefit of mankind or humankind, right? That's what you would, that's what you would believe in. Now, the Jains challenged this, and in some ways, in cer certain stories and cases, the Jains show how the, the Vedic truths were actually originally Jain truths, or within them were contained the truths of the Jain tradition. And so oftentimes, in rejecting the Veda's divine authorship, the Jains will also say that, and this is more historically as opposed to now, but the Jains would have said that the insights of the Vedas are actually Jain insights. They're Jain truths, right? And therefore we have the highest truth. 
Jains claim that their own texts, okay, meaning like the Jain texts, not the Hindu texts, are human of human omniscient authorship, meaning our people, our philosophers and our Tirtankaras were the ones who, one, achieved liberation by their own moral efforts, and two, gave these great teachings that have now been passed down in our texts and our teachings, right? So as opposed to the, the Vedas, which were supposedly just channeled by the Brahmin priests, the Urshis, to create the Vedic class society, which the Jains reject, the Jains say we authored the, our texts from human omniscient authorship, right? Through our own hard work. They also say that the Vedas are inferior because they contain animal sacrifice, right? Animal sacrifice is a brutal form of violence for the Jains, right? And what they see in the Vedic sacrifice where animals are being sacrificed is a form of violence that can only create more karma and can only lead to one's rebirth. So if you're performing Vedic sacrifice that involves animals, you are inflicting violence on the world that will ultimately cause your soul to be reborn. In the Jain tradition, that just wouldn't work, right? Another critique of the Hindus that comes from the Jain tradition, and I'm speaking more historically, I, today they get along much better than they did here, say, in, in the text that Dundas is citing. But they say that the Hindu gods were associated with worldly activity. Remember, the Jains and ultimately the ascetics are trying to transcend the world, release their soul from the world. But he says the Hindu gods are always fighting. They're, they have a fondness for women, right? So for example, in the Bhagavad Gita, you have Krishna on the battlefield with Arjuna and they're fighting and they're, and Krishna's arguing that it's okay to kill his co Arjuna's cousins. Or you have Radha and Krishna and the gopis and you have Krishna dancing around with women, making love to the cowgirls and all these things, right? So according to the Jains, these stories show some sort of inferiority among Hinduism, right? So we can see that this idea of universal religious tolerance isn't isn't a universal thing. They, there, there were critiques of the Hindu worldview. And finally, in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, as you see, these are the two great epics of the Hindu tradition in the last bullet point. They considered them to be mitya sutra, false scriptures that conveyed a message of violence because there's a lot of fighting in these texts, right? Such as in the Mahabharata, which you see conveyed here, the text, the Bhagavad Gita, has that great battle between Arjuna and his cousins. So these are Jain critiques of the Hindu tradition, right? So when we think about universal religious tolerance, historically speaking, we don't find evidence of that, right? Today, there would be more of a sense of universal religious tolerance among contemporary Jains, but there were these critiques of the Hindu tradition and they were real, they were written down. We have evidence of these things. And now to the Jains and the Buddhists. So both the Jains and the Buddhists were non-Vedic, right? So they would both be critiquing the Vedic worldview, but then they also critiqued each other, right? And the Jains, for example, viewed the Buddhist code of monastic law as too lax, right? You may recall that the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, before he was liberated, practiced all kinds of austerities, right? When he was trying to achieve liberation, he was near death. He was so skinny. You could see his ribs and his veins and everything. And he was out there trying to attain liberation and he realized, okay, this, all this extreme asceticism isn't doing it for me. So this is according to the Buddhist worldview, right? So the Buddha, before he became the Buddha, had to switch to his, path, his middle path, the middle way, a more balanced way of approaching reality and life and asceticism and so forth. And so he stopped these extreme practices and it was eventually liberated. Well, according to the Jains, this is, this is too lax, and it led to monastic law that was too lax, right? The monastics within the Buddhist tradition, the monks and nuns, did not have to work as hard as the Jain monastics did toward liberation. And the Jains, because they viewed the reality as, as full of karma and their bodies as full of karma that needed to be burned away, found that the way that the Buddhists lived their life was too lax and was actually creating more karma, right? Okay, and of course, the Buddhists had arguments back against that, but ultimately, the, the Jains, uh, you know, they're, they're more extreme, especially the Dagambaras, but also the Shvetambaras, they're more extreme, generally speaking, in their ascetic practice. And so they critiqued those who they saw as more lax than they were. You remember tapas and asceticism, that generating that austerity and that heat within one's body is respected in the Jain tradition. They also claimed that the Buddhists are perpetual meat eaters right? So while the Jains were strict vegetarians and today more and more vegans, they claimed that the Buddhists 
ate meat, which was not untrue, right? Even the Dalai Lama, as we know, this is a well-known fact, has had to eat meat for medical purposes, right? For in his diet. So the Dalai Lama eats meat, right? So th these aren't things that aren't, that are untrue, but for the Jains to eat meat is to inflict violence upon living beings. And so they, they made the critique of the Buddhists that because they ate meat, they were too lax, right? And they were inflicting violence upon living beings. Finally, they challenged the Buddhist sense of no self, right? So the Buddhists have the doctrine of anatman, that there is no self, that we have no ultimate self or soul. Whereas the Jains, as well as Hindus, believe that we have an inherently free soul that we have to free, or omniscient soul, or a blissful soul, depending on what tradition you're in, that must be liberated, right? But we have that permanent soul within each of us, right? So Jains and Hindus would agree on that. There is a soul that we all have. But the Buddhists don't have a soul. They have no self. They have the doctrine of no self, anatman. According to the Jains, this is not possible. We have to have some permanent entity, some permanent aspect of ourself, even if it's something that is just pure consciousness. It has to be something because if there is no fundamental self, if, if we don't have something that's unique and pure about us that we have to reach through some ethical or moral practice, then this could lead to moral anarchy because then we can just do whatever we want, right? If there's nothing that's going to be held accountable as in, in the Buddhist tradition, if there's no self, according to the Jains, this would lead to moral anarchy because then what's being held accountable? Do whatever you want. Obviously the Buddhists didn't do whatever they want. They led quite moral lives in, in, in a lot of cases, right? Uh, because they were also concerned about nonviolence and things like that, but just not to the extent that the, the Jains were, and they also had this doctrine of no self, right? So we can see that the Jains, as tolerant as they were, and still, and now are even more so probably, right, because they reinterpreted the doctrine of Anikantavada, maintained critiques against the Hindus and the Buddhists in order really, historically and philosophically, to establish their own their, their own tradition as unique and worthy of living. So this concludes our lecture on Anekantavada. And in our final lecture, we're going to continue to look at how Jains have adapted into the contemporary moment. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you then.